This is going to be verse by verse of Psalms chapter number 17. So Psalm 17 and verse 1. A prayer of David. Hear the right, O Lord. Attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. So David says, hear the right. There is something about praying when you know that you're right with God compared to when you're not right with God. And that's why it's best to stay living as right as you possibly can at all times. That way, when you pray, you have that extra faith and confidence. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Each time I pray, I tell God I'm sorry for anything I've done knowingly or unknowingly that wouldn't please Him because I want to stay in fellowship with God. David tells the Lord, Attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer. Do you ever stop and think about how amazing it is that God who made everything will hear your cry and give ear to your prayer? So Psalms 1, Psalms 17, 1, a prayer of David. Hear the right, O Lord. Attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. So feigned. Feigned is fake or pretend. The, are the prayers that come out of your mouth sincere and from the heart? Or are they feigned? Are they for show? James 5.16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What are your prayers like? Are they from the heart? Are they just something you pray every night and you don't even think about it, you're just saying it? Psalm 17, 2, let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. He said, let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Sentence as in a sentence for a crime. He wants his punishment to be just and right from the real judge of all the earth. Genesis eighteen twenty five says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? David wants his sentence to come from the judge of all the earth. And he's being pretty confident here because he knows God has seen everything he's done. But he feels like he's got his life cleaned up enough and that he's close to God enough to say these things. Psalm 17, 3, Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. So David said, Hear the right. In verse 1, he has examined himself. He believes that he can approach a righteous judge because he has been right. The Lord has visited him in the night. The Lord sees what you do at night. Could you come to the Lord with a clear conscience and say, Lord, you have seen me at night. You've seen what I've been doing. Night time is when the real wicked stuff goes on. Night time is when people do things that they wouldn't do in the daytime because they think people aren't looking, people aren't seeing. John 3.19 says, And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. There used to be a show called Talking Dirty After Dark. Used to at night, if you were up, you turn on the TV, you would see snowy channels and filthy movies. It's probably still like that. I imagine worse. You, you've heard the saying, the freaks come out at night. That's true because I've been to Walmart after working night shift at work and you see stuff in there that looks like it's not even from this planet. But David approaches the Lord with confidence and says, Thou hast visited me in the night. And the Lord has proved his heart. So David says, Hear the right. In Revelation 2.23, Jesus says, I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. David knows the Lord knows his heart. Matthew 9.4 says, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? The Lord can scan your heart and find evil things and good things. He knows if that prayer is coming out of faint lips or if you're speaking sincerely and genuine. Just because you do something outwardly and say something with your mouth doesn't mean you have the right heart motive. But the Lord sees the heart. 
1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So Psalm 17, 3, Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Could you examine your life right now and go to the Lord and say to him that he wouldn't find uncleanness presently in your life right now? David said, and shalt find nothing. David was confident that the Lord could search his heart and find nothing he was doing that was against him at that moment. You'll never be sinlessly perfect, but you should strive for it anyway. David obviously wasn't sinlessly perfect, but he strives for it. He obviously messed up more than once, as we clearly see. But at this time, he had examined his life and set himself apart for the Lord. Also, you have to take into account the things are amped up in the New Testament in regards to sin. You know, David, he's in the Old Testament. And when Jesus Christ showed up, he raised the standards even higher. For example, in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, he says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So Jesus placed even more of an emphasis on a man having a clean thought life. Even more of an emphasis than the Old Testament has. Things are amped up a bit in the Old Testament. Uh, more is expected out of you in the New Testament. A lot of people think, well, it, it was harder in the Old Testament because, you know, you had all the sacrifices and the, and the people being stoned to death and things like that. But Jesus amped it up even more. It's more emphasis on things like your thought life, things like that. A much more emphasis on it. I'm not saying that they could they could just have a bad thought life in the Old Testament, but it's things are just amped up more in the New Testament because you, the saints now we got the Holy Spirit indwelling us permanently. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit could come and go. Things are different. Things are just different in the New Testament. And it's you, you gotta. It's it's harder to stay right now. I mean, look at all we have now on the TV that people see, grow up watching, the way people are, the way this world is, the way the devil is. His chain is a lot longer. It's harder to stay right, but that doesn't mean we have an excuse not to be right. We need to continue to strive for perfection even though we'll never be sinlessly perfect. Psalm seventeen four says, Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Notice that by the words of thy lips. David says, by the words of thy lips. That is the words of God. You know by reading Psalms 119 that David was a Bible man. By the words of the Lord, he stayed away from the paths of the destroyer. David was walking the good and narrow way. He wasn't following people down the highway to damnation. Now, who is this destroyer? The, the, the paths of the destroyer, he says. Who is it? I believe it's the devil himself because John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, if we look at this the way a tribulation saint might look at it, you could say it's the Antichrist. The Antichrist, the son of perdition. Perdition as in destruction. You want to stay away from the paths of the destroyer if you were a tribulation saint. And how are they going to stay on the right path? By reading the Word of God. Many people are probably going to lose the Word of God because they're going to try to take it away from you soon. But God's going to get it to them somehow. They're already hiding the Word of God for people in places for that time period. So what you have here, though, is a man, David, who is living right and is in close fellowship with God, and he is sending out humble prayers to the Lord and feeling like he can get his prayers answered. It says in Psalm 17, 5, Hold up my goings and thy paths, that thy footsteps slip not. So who's able to keep you from falling? Jude 24 says, No unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. The Lord is able to keep your footsteps from slipping. 
Psalms 1836 says, Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not slip. If you keep your eyes on Jesus and on the Bible, then you're going to be a lot less likely to slip or to stray from the right path. Psalm 17, 6, I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thine ear unto me, and hear my speech. Do you ever stop to think about how incredible it is that God can hear and process everything going on in the entire universe at the same time, and to top it all, keep record of it? Not just every human, but all the innumerable company of angels, all of their conversations and their thoughts is also heard by the Lord. Someone asked me, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it still make a sound? Well, that's a stupid question because God's always present to hear it. God sees everything going on. God can hear a million saints praying at the same time that don't even know each other and each one feeling like they are the only saint left that's praying. Psalm 17, 7. Show thy marvelous loving kindness. O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. So God is a God of wrath, but also a God of love. And remember John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave. As a born-again believer, God loves you more than anyone ever loved you in your life. He shows loving kindness, marvelous loving kindness to you every day. He even shows marvelous loving kindness to lost people. It says in Matthew 5, 45, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So God lets lost people live, and even live in luxury. He lets them live in comfort, and is patient and long-suffering with them every day. This is him showing marvelous loving kindness to every person who ever lived. So it says, Psalm 17, 7, Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. So how did Joshua and Caleb be so courageous against giants? They trusted in the one bigger than the giants were. They put their trust in the one who's bigger than the ones that are rising up against them. If you're saved and doing the Lord's work, then anyone who rises up against you is rising up against God too. Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Psalm 17.8, Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. If you are a born-again Christian, you are the also the apple of the Lord's eye. Think about the person you love the most and how you feel when you see them. And God loves you even more than that. Now David tells him to hide him under the shadow of his wings. When you stop to think about someone like David, he would make everyone, all men in the world today look like a big sissy. I mean, he fought the giant, he fights all kinds of people, slew ten thousands of God's enemies, yet he knows he's weak and knows he needs the Lord's protection. It's like when you're little and you get behind your dad's arm for protection. And David goes to the Heavenly Father and says, Hide me under the shadow of thy wings, a tough man, like David, who had fought innumerable amount of enemies. And, you know, I'm sure he was brought up a lot rougher than we are today in America. I sometimes think about these Old Testament characters, and I think, uh, could I even survive in the settings that they grew up in with the raising I've had and the luxuries I've had and the comfort I've had? Psalm 17, 8 and 9. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings from the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who can pass me about. People are always talking about oppression. If you're living for the world, then the world will love you. But if you live for the Lord, it will hate you and oppress you. You will have deadly enemies. The deadly enemies of a Christian are, number one, his own flesh. Romans 8.13 says, For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. Your flesh is an enemy. You have to fight the flesh. You have to beat down the flesh. It wants to do bad things. Well, the spirit in you wants to do good things. You have to choose the spirit. 
You have to yield yourself to the Holy Spirit every day. Paul says, I die daily. He has to die daily to the flesh. He has to tell the flesh that it's dead and live for the Spirit because the Spirit's alive. So number one, that's your first big enemy. That's probably going to bother you the most is your flesh because you got it. It's, it's always on you until you leave at the rapture. Another deadly enemy for the Christian is the wicked woman. A wicked, beautiful woman is one of the most dangerous and deadly enemies on earth for the Christian man. The Christian man has flesh and her body that's uncovered with uh, the attire of an harlot appeals to the, his eyes and his flesh. It says in Proverbs 7.27, Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. And there are many Christian women who are acting like that wicked woman, the deadly enemy to the Christian man, because she goes around dressed like an harlot. If you're a Christian woman and you go around dressed like an harlot, you're acting like that wicked woman that flatters with her eyelids and things like that. You don't want to give a Christian man a problem with the eyes and appeal to his flesh in that way. Proverbs 7, 27, as I said, her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. She looks good on the outside, but her intentions are evil, and her ways are the ways of death. A third enemy of the Christian today is the devil himself, the destroyer. He walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And a lot of the stuff that happens is just your flesh, but a lot of it is the devil himself tempting you and trying to destroy you. And a fourth enemy is just the rest of the unclean spirit world, spoken of in Ephesians 6 as the rulers of the darkness of this world. For each and every one of these enemies, you are going to need protection and to hide under the shadow of the Lord's wings, just like David wanted to do. Psalm 17, 8, keep me as the apple of the eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings, from the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who can pass me about. You ever feel like the world, the flesh, the devil, and everything wicked is surrounding you? They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. So they are enclosed in their own fat. Imagine the rich people as fat and the poor people as skinny. Because, you know, the Bible's speaking in that way. Look at famous people. They are surrounded and tied up in all their worldly goods to the point that all their confidence is in what they can buy, so they speak proudly. All their confidence is in their own material things. And if you look at this from a tribulation saint's standpoint, you know, the saints in the tribulation are going to be poor. The enemies of God are going to be rich. rich. They're going to be enclosed in their own fat. And they're going to speak proudly with their mouth. And they're going to oppress the, the poor saints in the tribulation. That's going to be real oppression. A lot worse than what these people think they got going on today. They're going to be hunted and killed and eaten in religious worship services. Psalm 17, 11, and 12. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bang down to the earth like as a lion that is greedy of his prey and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. So you are going to face lions just like the saints did in the Bible. You know the story. You know the story of Daniel in the lion's den. You know how Paul was delivered from the mouth of the lion. There are lions lurking in secret places, ready to jump on you at any moment. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And this is why you need to take on the whole armor of God. This way, you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You can be like Benaiah in 2 Samuel 23, 20, which says, And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzal, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit on a time in a time of snow. These were spiritual lion tamers. They fought lions. They stopped the mouths of lions. 
Psalm 17, 13, Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. So he's saying, Arise, O Lord, disappoint him. He wants him to disappoint that lion. That word arise has to do with the second coming. David is praying for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. You see, God uses the wicked as puppets. He uses them as his sword. And he will even use wicked men to chasten his children. If you stay in rebellion, he will raise up a wicked man just to be a thorn in your flesh. The wicked is his sword. The devil is mentioned as his rod. He uses the devil as a rod. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. In the tribulation, at the sec after the tribulation, at the second coming, when the Lord arises, he's going to take that Antichrist, he's going to cast him down. The Antichrist and the false prophet are going to be cast into the, into the lake of fire. And that's when God's going to deliver his, the soul of his people from the wicked. That he's used as a sword in the time of Jacob's trouble. Psalm seventeen fourteen, From men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world, which have their portion in this life, whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure, they are full of children, and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. So David says, from men which are thy hand. Like I said, God would take a lost man and backhand you with him if, you, if you're living wrong. This can be one of his ways of chastening his children. These are men of the world. These wicked men are men of the world. That would be men like Don Lemon, Joe Biden, Jay-Z, Bill Maher. These men have their mind on earthly things. Their belly is full of good treasure. God is letting them have things in this life. This is more of a curse than a blessing because they're just coasting. They're living wicked and they're just coasting through life straight to hell. It's like they got a, just a perfect path prepared for them on the way to hell fire. They are full of children, as the verse said, and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. All the stuff they're compiling would just be left to their kids after them. And who knows what their kid would do with it after they're gone, as Ecclesiastes talks about. Psalm seventeen fifteen, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. So David is determined to be satisfied with the Lord and with what the Lord has given him. He's, be, he's determined to be satisfied with the Lord alone. Just like Paul is. Paul said in Philippians 4, 11, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. In Proverbs it says, the eyes of man are never satisfied. Eve's eyes weren't satisfied with all the stuff she had gotten. That's why she took off the wrong tree. All the trees were pleasant to the sight. But she chose the one that was pleasant to the sight that she wasn't supposed to eat off of because her eyes couldn't get satisfied. Man, a man cheats on his wife because his eyes aren't satisfied with his own wife. Men are covetous. They want stuff that's not theirs. But David says, I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. And one of these days we're going to wake up with his likeness. The Lord's likeness. Our vile body shall be fashioned like unto his glorious body at the rapture. We're going to, uh, we don't know what kind of body we're going to have. A hundred percent. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. He shall change our vile body and fashion it like unto his glorious body. This corruptible shall put on incorruption. This mortal shall put on immortality. That's all going to happen at the rapture. We're going to have his likeness. But right now we need to be satisfied with all he's given us. And one day we'll truly be satisfied with, with ourselves. Because we're not going to have this sin anymore. We're going to be like the Lord. But this has been a quick study on Psalms chapter number 17.